Wasn't that wonderful? Amen. Let me ask you to take your Bibles and please turn once again to Nehemiah chapter 6. Nehemiah chapter 6. We're going to be reading from verses 15 on through verse 4 of chapter 7. So the wall was finished on the 25th day of the month of Elul in 52 days. And when all our enemies heard of it, all the nations around us were afraid and fell greatly in their own esteem, for they perceived that this work had been accomplished with the help of our God. Moreover, in those days, the nobles of Judah sent many letters to Tobiah, and Tobiah's letters came to them. For many in Judah were bound by oath to him because he was the son-in-law of Shechaniah, the son of Era, and his son Jehoanan had taken the daughter of Meshulam, the son of Berechiah, as his wife. Also, they spoke of his good deeds in my presence and reported my words to him, and Tobiah sent letters to make me afraid. And when the wall had been built and I had set up the doors and the gatekeepers, the singers, and the Levites had been appointed, I gave my brother Hanani and Hananiah, the governor of the castle, charge over Jerusalem, for he was a more faithful and God-fearing man than many. And I said to them, Let not the gates of Jerusalem be open until the sun is hot, and while they are still standing guard, let them shut and bar the doors. Appoint guards from among the inhabitants of Jerusalem, some at their guard posts and some in front of their own homes. The city was wide and large, but the people within it were few, and no houses had been rebuilt. As we, as we think about this moment in the life of uh, Nehemiah and the people of the city of Jerusalem, there's really one word that came to my mind, and that's this word resilient. And it's, it's what I would use to describe Nehemiah in this passage of Scripture. He, what made him resilient was his dogged determination to complete his task and to press on no matter what obstacles may have come in his way. He would not allow anything to deter him or cause him from deviating from completing his God-assigned task. And so a keen understanding of, of the importance of the task is a key to being a resilient person. It goes, it holds true in any way. You know, anybody who has a goal in life, you know, if you want to run a marathon, you keep that in mind. If you want to accomplish a task, you keep that in mind. And then, and then when those difficulties come, which they will happen, you are able to press on because you developed a, a resilience. And this is one of those attributes that we have to, to develop but the fatigue of the people and what they were experiencing as you read these chapters is it's just palpable. You can just feel the exhaustion. You can see the exhaustion. You can see the onslaught of the enemy. You can feel and sense what they're going through. And even Nehemiah was exhausted. And as the people, they were fatigued. They pressed on due to the fact that they knew that their mission was powered by God, by their devotion to God, that it was his mission that they were on. They were strengthened by the fact that they were setting out to fulfill his, his mission. See, occasionally resilience is merely putting one foot in front of the other and just pressing on no matter what, plodding along and just completing the task, even pressing on, even though you may not feel like it, just continuing on, knowing that somewhere in the path there will be an opportunity, even though you're exhausted, to take a moment to, to rest. So the best thing to do, as we see in this, this passage of Scripture, I mean, they completed this task in 52 days, which is a phenomenal thing. So what powered them? What powered Nehemiah? It was an innate belief that was deep down within him that he knew he was doing what God wanted him to do, that completing the mission was bigger than he was, that the mission was God-sized, and and it required that God come alongside him for it to be completed. God would have to empower him. God would have to strengthen him. And God would have to aid his people as they did the mission that they were required to do. You know, in the process of this, we need to be keenly aware of the working of the Holy Spirit. 
at those moments and where we're exhausted, uh, we recognize God's Holy Spirit working in our lives and empowering us and, and furthering His mission as he, as he begins to work in our hearts and to give us that strength as we devote ourselves to Him and to, to God's Word. We must recognize His working in our lives to complete the mission He's called us to do. We also must remember what Philippians 4.13 says. It says, I can do all things through Christ who strengtheneth me who, or who strengthens me. And what that means is we can complete the mission that God has called us to do. We can press on no matter what, doing what God has called us to do. When we rely on the empowerment of the Holy Spirit, He helps us to press on. It is His power and His strength working through us so we can press on. We may need a respite. We may need a break. We may, may need a moment to take a knee. You know, in, in those sweaty days when we were marching in the Marine Corps and we were out in the, the desert and, you know, we would just be drenched with sweat and almost to the place where we lost all of our sweat because we had just sweat that much. Our, uh, our platoon commander would say, take a knee, and that meant grab your canteen and drink some water. That means take a moment to refresh yourself. But when we refreshed ourselves, we were destined or forced to press on. So we press on. And that's what we see here in this passage of Scripture. They pressed on and they completed goal number one. They had re arrived at a place where they, they had completed the first thing that God wanted them to do, which was to rebuild this wall. I mean, there were other, other things that they needed to do, but it was even during this process of of God working, God blessing, God guiding. And as you and I understand the working of the Holy Spirit in our lives, there were still obstacles, there were still adversaries, there were still foes, there were still difficulties that came along the way. So the first thing we need to understand is that we, we must press on despite the obstacles. You see, Nehemiah, he refused to give in to the pressure. In fact, as we've noticed... This wall was completed in 52 days in troubled times. The mission went on despite the pushback. And it was an embarrassment to the enemy. But listen to me carefully. Our enemy never gives up. They didn't give up. Satan is not a quitter. He stays in the field and he keeps attempting to bring us down even though it may seem as though he has lost the battle. One man said it this way, many a careless Christian has won the war, but afterward has lost the victory. You see, Satan is always looking for an opportune time, as we see in the life of Jesus, to attack the victors and turn those individuals into victims. So we need to heed that, that advice of this saintly Scottish minister, Andrew A. Bonar, who said this, let us be as watchful after the victory as before the battle. And that was an encouragement to Nehemiah to remember that even though they had completed task number one, the enemy was going to attack. I mean, in fact, if you can't see Satan working, it's probably because he's gone underground. He's silent, but he's still working. In fact, his agents are often working in the background in, a, in an undetected manner. Or he's working in the background inciting minions. And so, as one man said, we're oftentimes safer when we can see him work than in those quiet times. So open opposition to God's work and God's worker should cause us to be alert, should cause us to be mindful of what's going on. Remember what Nehemiah said earlier in chapter 4, verse 9, he says, watch and pray. It is our task to always be watchful, always be vigilant because we have an adversary and an enemy. Now, as you as you read this passage of Scripture or heard me read it, it's incredible to, in my mind to think that any Jew would secretly cooperate with the enemy. I mean, but you see what was going on in the life of Nehemiah. And what was even more perplexing is that it wasn't just anybody, it was the nobles. It was the royal people of the tribe of Judah. And if anybody had a stake in the city of David, it was these individuals uh, you see, because after all, God had promised that the Savior and the King would come from their nation, from their tribe. And so when these nobles, they were cooperating with Tobiah, 
They were actually resisting the Lord, disobeying the word, and they were jeopardizing their very own future. It's interesting, and we must consider the relationship between Tobiah and these individuals. The, the relationship with Tobiah tainted their judgment. It was the nobles who wished to maintain this relationship with Tobiah. And Tobiah wanted to keep this relationship with the neighbors for the purpose of trade, uh, for, for social reasons, for whatever the reasons were, for all the personal benefits, rather than the benefit of the city of Jerusalem. But why should this be such a, why should they do such a treacherous thing? Well, for one thing, Tobiah wrote letters and he was influencing their thinking. They were, they were conceiving and thinking in their mind and Tobiah had his self motives in which he was trying to sway the interests of the people of Jerusalem. It was all for himself. So instead of seeking the truth, the nobles believed the enemy's lies, became traitors to their own people, to God's appointed leader, and to the work that God had commissioned. They didn't want this work to be completed. Tobiah didn't want this work to be completed. He wanted the walls down. He wanted the gates down. He wanted the city in rubble and ruin. For whatever reason, we don't know. But they believed Tobiah. They believed that he was right. And some of the men, as the text tells us, they even made oaths to Tobiah. So... So Tobiah, whatever he wrote to them, it was probably flattery. It was probably promises that he made to them. He was talking about a balance of peace that was going to be swayed because of this wall. Whatever the case may be, they foolishly believed Tobiah. And so then the Sikh, the nobles, they shared these letters with others, and they started influencing people. And so as we read in the passage of Scripture, even though the work had been going on, the uh, the influence of the people was becoming even broader and more uh, abundant, so the conspiracy grew. Let me give you a little caution. Remember this statement I'm about to say. Don't believe everything you read or hear about a Christian leader, whether it's in the news or whether it's in the ear of someone else. Consider the source. Consider the, unless you have firm and um, acceptable truth, if you have something documented, don't necessarily believe everything you read or hear about a Christian leader. You see, there are sometimes you wonder, as I think about what's going on in our world today, as I think about the Christian church today, as I think about what we observe and what we see, it kind of reminds us of what it says in Jeremiah chapter 9, verse 4. Jeremiah said this, let everyone beware of his neighbor and put no trust in any brother, for every brother is a deceiver and every neighbor goes about as a slanderer. So when a community is at a place like that, the enemy has a strong presence. And so we as God's children, we need to be focused upon what God has called us to do, what God has called us to be. We follow him. So how could these Jews turn their back on their heritage? How could they turn their back on their own brothers and sisters and ultimately their God? You see, the, the bonds of their human connection seem to be stronger than their bonds of spiritual affection. Tobiah was, he was tied to the tribe of Judah through marriage. The nobles gave him loyalty due to the fact that he was part of the family. But they should have given this loyalty to God. They should have given this loyalty to Nehemiah. They should have given this loyalty to the building of God's wall. They didn't, though. The men of Judah, they forgot that ultimately they were married to the Lord, that he was the one they were to be devoted to, him, him alone, not the others. So before we, before we think about these, these Jews and these nobles, we need to examine our own personal lives. Are we totally obedient to the Lord? Are we fully obedient to God? Do we ever allow human relationships to influence our decisions so that we deliberately abandon God's design or, his, or disobey His word in some way, shape, or form? I mean, do we? You know, in 31 years of pastoral ministry, I have seen more than one professed Christian leave church fellowship because of something that was done to a relative or something that was done in the church, you have too. And so we need to be very careful. We need to make sure that our loyalties are to the Lord, 
to the Lord God Almighty and not to Tobiah or people like him. You've heard this expression that blood is thicker than water. What that means is that oftentimes our our familial relationships are more influential and we, we feel like we have more of an obligation to them. But we must remember that we have been adopted into the family of God. We belong to Him. That is where we have been blood bought and that is the blood that courses through our spiritual veins. We are devoted to Him. We've been adopted into His family and that is where our loyalty lies. Matthew 10, verse 37 says this, Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. He said the the blood-bought bind, our blood-bought bond that we have with Jesus Christ, it unites us, and that is the strongest bond of all. Years ago, in the very first church I served, I remember a gentleman, and a wonderful, wonderful gentleman. He was up in his 80s, and and um, and I and we had a we were having a discussion, and he said something that kind of caught me off guard. And I said, you know, he was talking about something that someone had said to him, and I said, do you do you believe that? And he said, oh yeah, they're blood. I believe them. And so I said, well, there you go. You see, and that's how we often think about it, but our relationships are first and foremost sifted through our relationship with God. All others are secondary. You see, the nobles of Judah, they weren't satisfied to get their information. Uh, They weren't just satisfied to get their information from Tobiah. They felt a need to tell Tobiah everything that Nehemiah said. What does it say? No doubt they were hoping to win Tobiah's favor, to to garner some special blessing from him. Um, you know, one of the greatest rewards in their mind, in their thinking, as we see here, is possibly that when Tobiah and his friends took over Jerusalem, that in some sense, those who were the traitors of the nation and the Lord would receive, receive some blessing. See, but these traitors went even further. They repeatedly told Nehemiah that uh, Tobiah was a fine man. He really was. But Tobiah really had his own self-interest at heart. Proverbs 28.4 says this, Those who forsake the law praise the wicked, but those who keep the law strive against them. You know, had the nobles of Judah been studying God's word and meditating on God's word, they would have walked in a different way. Psalm 1 says it this way, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of the sinners, nor sits in the seats of the scornful or the scoffer. But the wise individual, they walk in the counsel of the godly, not in the counsel of the ungodly. These nobles, they were blinded by the lies, they were blinded by the flattery, and they were completely out of touch with any spiritual reality. And as we see from 1 John, there was no light in them. So Tobiah kept sending letters to his informers. And they in turn kept telling people to change their allegiance before Jerusalem was taken by the Gentiles. And Nehemiah, he plugged on. He ignored the letters, he ignored the threats, and he kept working until the job was completed. And after all, his work, as we see in verse 16, was wrought of God. How do we know today our work is of God? How do we know what we're doing is pleasing God? Well, we see lives changed. We see souls saved. We see lives transformed. That's how we know. I mean, there are, there are quiet times in which all we're doing is casting the seed and we're, we're sowing seed and we're tilling the soils, spiritually speaking. But we know beyond the shadow of a doubt when we see souls being saved that that's the blessings of God. We know that that time is His blessing. So Tobiah, he was, he was encouraging his, his informers And he was trying to get information from them. But Nehemiah was firmly committed to this truth that the work was wrought of God and God will complete his task. He will complete his mission. Philippians 1.6 says this, and I am sure of this, that he who has began a good work in you will be faithful to complete it. And so he will complete it. 
at the day of Christ Jesus or Jesus Christ. It is, it is the certainty that God's mission will go on no matter what, but sometimes despite us. Sometimes in spite of us, God's work will continue on. See, verse 15 marks the end of part of the story. So the wall was finished, but this also marked a new beginning for Nehemiah now had to, uh, uh, to protect what he had accomplished. He needed to protect, and so this begins the second theme in the book of Nehemiah. See, the walls were completed, the gates were restored, and the enemy was irked. The enemy didn't like it. But Nehemiah's work was not finished by any means. He had to be patient. He had to do exactly what he was supposed to do. And it's like, like Paul emphasized in Ephesians 6, 13. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand in the evil day. And having done all, stand firm. And so Nehemiah was at this place now where he was going to stand firm firm. Nehemiah had been steadfast in building the walls and in resisting the enemy, and now he was going to stand in a steadfast manner. So we see this first of all. Secondly, we, we ask the question, how did Nehemiah prepare for the future? We see this beginning at verse 1 of chapter 7. He, he enlisted leaders. It's interesting who he selected. It's people he selected. It's people that he chose. It's people that he knew had a heart for the work you see, it's the task of the leader to enlist new leaders. It's task, it was his task. He has to think of the future, and he knows who will continue working in such a way that the mission will be accomplished. It's up to the leader. We saw it this morning in our Sunday school lesson. We saw uh, Peter, uh, James, and, and John, Jesus' inner circle. He had his inner circle. We understand that with the life of Jesus. We see it here in ne Nehemiah's life. He selected and he chose those who would continue to work. So how did Nehemiah prepare for the future? He selected leaders. You see, in verse number two, he, he enlisted these assistants. And like all good leaders, Nehemiah uh, knew he couldn't do the job alone. It's, it becomes quite obvious when you, when you start cresting the 60th year of your life that there are certain things you can't accomplish anymore. There are certain things you won't be able to accomplish anymore. And therefore, it's essential that, that a leader begin to instill and point out and to select leaders who are young who can carry on the mission. Nehemiah here, he chose some who were capable leaders. So why did he choose these individuals? Why did he choose these assistants? Well, he could trust them. His brother Hanani and Hananiah, uh, we see these individuals as significant individuals in the scripture. We see later that he also selected men like Raphael and Shalom. We see men that he chose to continue to do the work that he had started. Uh, you know, in a very short period of time in this account, he's going to head back for a brief period of time, but he's going to come back. But what we see here in this passage of scripture is that he chose individuals who could continue the work. Why was Nehemiah convinced that these men were good leaders? Well, they, they had two wonderful qualities. They were faithful to God and they feared God. They were faithful to Him and they feared God. Dr. Bob Jones Sr. said this, and I agree with this statement, the greatest ability is dependability. I mean, that's one thing we, we need today. We need dependable people. We need people who can be depended on, uh, people who will do what they say they will do. That's not always the case, is it? That's not always the instance, but we need individuals who are like this. And if we truly fear the Lord, we will be faithful to do the work that He's called us to do. You see, when leaders fear people instead of fearing God, they end up getting trapped, and that leads to failure. See, not everyone is called to be a Nehemiah. But any one of us can be like Hanani or Hananiah or Raphael or Shalom. Any one of us can be an individual like that. Uh, someone who has God-given leadership um, that can help the God-given leadership to get the job done. God is looking for faithful, obedient, dependable people, God-fearing men and women who will have the conviction and the courage to serve Him no matter what. Press on. 
In verses 1 through 3, we see he appointed in, in his uh, future plan, he appointed gatekeepers. Uh, what good are new strong gates if, if anybody guarding them uh, and controlling them, uh, they just lay their weapons down and let anybody come and go as they please. But we, we understand the importance of that when we talk about a city. What, what, what good are walls if the gates are open and every foe can come in at any time? As I read this, uh, thought about this this week, I was reminded of a story about the Great Wall of China, which is obviously an impenetrable wall. But at least four times in the, in the history of China, there were uh, people who came through the wall. How did this happen? Well, they, they bribed a guard. They bribed a guard who was more devoted to something other than the, the mission. They bribed guards, and so the enemy would come in and, and make the assaults. You see, the gatekeepers were given specific instructions here in our text. When to open the gate, when to close the gate. You see, there's parameters in all of this. There's parameters. The gates were to be open early in the morning and only invite those individuals in who they knew. And they would keep guard on those others that came in. So he appointed guards. Nehemiah appointed two kinds of guards, those who patrol the walls at specific stations and those who would keep watch near their houses. So he appointed different kinds of people. Many people worked in these many areas, and now Nehemiah was challenging them to simply to guard the areas that they had built. Guards watching the gates, watchmen on the walls, they had a, a solid neighborhood watch. The city was safe from an outside attack. See, all of this has a message for us today. If, if God's people don't protect what they've accomplished for the Lord, the enemy will come in and take it over. See, Paul's admonition here must be heeded, and having done all, stand firm. We must stand firm. We must stand firm in a theological way. I, I can't think of many of our schools and seminaries even today that once were very solid theological institutions that haven't, haven't allowed the enemy to come into the gate and has maybe reduced the, the validity of the message, changed the message. And what once were, were places that were iconic of preparing and, and training uh, people for the mission field and training people for the pastorate have just become clubs. We see that in our, our theological institutions. But what about in our churches? We need to hold guards over our church. We, we think about Christian parents. They need to guard their homes lest their children fall prey to the enemy. Matthew 13, 25 says this, But while his men were sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. We need to be watchful. We need to be vigilant. We need to watch and pray. We need to be cautious. We need to be careful. See, even, even while God's uh, servants are asleep, overconfident, uh, the enemy can come in and plant his counterfeits in, so we need to be awake and alert. And this is really very important in our day of pluralism. Uh, that doesn't mean we agree with everyone. We shouldn't agree with everyone. In fact, we, we hold to a, a very distinct group in, of beliefs. We shouldn't agree with everybody. There's not everybody that, that, that holds to the truth of the, the basic doctrines we hold to as Christians. And we are different. We are different. We need to guard the gates. We need to remember that we are different. And as Christians, we, we guard everything we do we test everything we do by God's word, his word alone. You know, there are many religions. There are many theological uh, camps out there. But you and I, one of the most important truths that we must hold to is this one we find in Acts chapter 4, verse 12. It says, neither is there salvation in any other name, for there's no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. It is in the name of Jesus that we plant our hope our desires, and for you and I, if we are blood-bought by Jesus Christ, we owe him our allegiance. We owe him absolutely everything. We need to keep guards at the gate and watchers on the wall. Nehemiah, we see here, and this is very important, he established citizenship. 
Now we look at verses 5 through 69, which I'm not going to read for you. Uh, but 5 through 69 talk about this citizenship that Nehemiah was enforcing. And we, un we easily understand it here, don't we? We easily understand here in the United States of America that we need some border protection. We, we understand as we talk about Jerusalem that, that there needs to be some sort of measure for citizenship. That's what we see here in this passage of Scripture. So what we observe is a complete list of those in verses uh, 5 through 69 of those individuals who were citizens. And this is important. They had the appropriate qualifications. Um, they, uh, their roles mattered. What they did mattered. They had a wall for a reason. They had a citizenry for a reason. They had these things for protection. We had it, they had it for protection. They had a wall for the reason. There were scribes who kept public records about who, who were the citizens, who they were. They kept public records and updated them as the community grew and it changed. In fact, they're very clear about what they're doing. You know, we're a melting pot as a, you know, the United States of America. But in Jerusalem at this time, because of what they had just come through, the important thing was for a Jew to be able to prove their ancestry. The genealogies, they were the lifelines. Uh, they linked the Jews to their heritage. And one of the problems with Tobiah is that Tobiah could not prove his lineage. He was actually, as we discovered in our first or second message in Nehemiah, that he was part, uh, he had some Jewish heritage, but he couldn't prove it. And so he was treated differently. He wanted to be in control, but he, he couldn't be in control because he couldn't prove his genealogy. So genealogies were the lifeline. We say sometimes that, that, that as we look at passages of Scripture like this, we, we often will say, well, we don't see any place where people in the Bible are numbered. Well, they're numbered here. They're calculated down to the, down to the individual. The numbers in Ezra, slightly different. But they, they took records. They took a role. We understand it back then. We somehow think, it's not something that applies to us today, but it does. You see, for them not to be able for them to prove their ancestry meant this. They were, they were second-class citizens. And quite honestly, some could play a role in the government. Some could not. That's exactly the reason why. So Nehemiah, he wanted to populate this city with citizens, those who knew they were Jews, and they were quite proud of it. One group, and one of the final things I'm going to say today is this. There's one group, including some priests, who were unable to prove their genealogies. And for the priests, that meant that they were being cut off. They were cut off from temple ministry. They were cut off from the income. They were cut off from their livelihood. But the law of Moses made it clear that only those who family, whose family line was clearly in the family of Aaron could minister at the altar. There were also some 7,000 servants who were there who were, were not... Active participants, they were just there. And so what we see is that there were some 42,000 congregants, 42,000 individuals, more or less, and there was a number of them that were not active in the governmental procedures. So that's important. So the question is, if I had to prove my genealogy in order to get into God's city, could I do it? Could you prove your genealogy? I mean, you're heading as, as an individual for one or two destinies. It's heaven or it's hell. It doesn't matter if your name's on the church roll. What it matters is if you're saved or not. What it matters is if you know Christ or not. It matters if you have your allegiance to Christ or not. And if you have your allegiance to Christ, you've been saved, you've been blood-bought, you are part of God's family. We need to live, act, act, and operate like this. See, only those who belong to God's family can enter heaven. We understand that. And you can enter God's family as you embrace Christ as your Lord and Savior. That is what alone guarantees you entrance into heaven. That's, that alone is what guarantees your, your place in the family of God. I hope today you put your trust in him.
I mean, maybe, maybe you think you have. Maybe you haven't. Put your hope and your trust in Him. So today, what I want you to do is this. Consider the importance of finishing the job that God has called you to do. As my friend Sonny Holmes would always say, finish, period. Just, just press on. Just keep doing. Do what God's called you to do. I know you're tired. I, I recognize it. I know you're weary. I know you're fatigued. But just pray for strength and press on. This is God's job. It's His mission. Ask Him to empower you to continue on. Today, I want you to consider the obstacles that are in front of you. I don't know what they are. I don't know if they're personal, professional. I don't know if it's a health condition. I don't know if it's an emotional condition. Press on. Just press on because God's called you to this. And He, he is the one who's in charge. And, and he, may, he might just say to you, it's time to take a knee. Take a sip of water. Take a moment. Take some time for a little bit of rest but I'm going to want you to continue moving on. Today, won't you consider pressing on? Why? Why continue? Why press on? Because the job's not done. I hope that today you will consider this fact that as long as you have breath to breathe, as long as God has given you strength to walk, He wants you to press on. And I pray that today that we as a congregation would find it within our heart and our heart's desire just to press on. Be resilient. And yes, you're in good company Lock arms with one of your fatigued and your tired brothers and sisters in Christ. And remember that this mission is greater than you and me. It's God-sized. Pray for strength. And press on. Heavenly Father, we just pray that you'd help us as we close out this time of our worship today. That we would find it within our hearts, Lord, too. Remember the importance of pressing on. Lord, sometimes it's difficult on this journey. There's not a single one of us in this room who don't know that. I mean, Lord, sometimes there are, there are just personal things that are going on. We have no one to go to, nowhere to turn to except you. I pray that you would carry us. Sometimes there are other issues going on outside of us, Lord, that we have no control over that are pressing in on us. And all we can do, Lord, is trust you. I pray today that by the strength and the power of your Holy Spirit, Lord, that you would just move in our midst. Lord, give us a comfort that comes from only the comforter, the one who we trust to carry us through in these difficult times. Help us to trust you. We pray these things in the name of Jesus, our Lord and our Savior. Amen. If you would please stand as we prepare to sing a hymn of decision. And I hope today you will decide that no matter what, that you will press on.